Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Objective. And today is a very special episode because we are going to be talking about a very influential and important philosopher who you must have heard of by now, Immanuel Kant. Look at the thickness of that book. Yeah, just don't ask me to read it. Um, Now, if you've read Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff's nonfiction, there's a good chance you've come to see Kant as kind of like the final boss of the objectivist video game, so to speak. Like he is, you know, he's it. He's the cause of so much strife and he's the one you need to find and destroy. But uh, all too often, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone in the past, uh, we sometimes tend to run out into the world and announce Kant. Where's Kant? Let's find him. Let's kill him without really even knowing who that is or what he said. And I'm happy to say that on the Daily Objective, uh, Kant is rarely mentioned. I'm happy to say that because none of us hosts are experts on Kant until today. Let's meet our uh, resident uh, philosophical historian and genius, in my opinion. Please welcome Jason Rines. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Uh, I have to take issue of something you said. I don't consider myself um, a Kant expert. Um, I've, I've, you know, written about Kant. I've certainly taught Kant many times. Um, I'm not up to date on, you know, the, the scholarly literature on Kant. I, I'm like at least 10 years um, behind. There was a time uh, in, in graduate school um, when I was working closely with, I guess, I think the world's top Kant scholar, Paul Geyer, and um, and I was, and I worked with others like Lanier Anderson, Alan Wood, and I was really into it, and I still am really into it, uh, and I hope to be teaching Kant, um, you know, in, in the future. I hope to write more on Kant, but, but I'm not, like, I'm more of an ancient philosophy specialist than a Kant specialist. So I, I know my Kant pretty well, but, uh, but I'm not like a capital K Kant specialist. Okay, for our purposes, you are what what we can loosely call an expert, but you're not like uh, you're not the leading expert in the world. So that's so interesting, though, that just in the last 10 years, there's there have been discoveries and all types of takes that people have had about Kant. So it's not like um, it's not like all there is to know about Kant has already been uh, discovered and understood. Like people are constantly delving deeper into what he said, even to this very day. I, I know that they're doing that. I, I can't. I can't say if there's a, been a big or major turn in the last ten years because, like I said, I haven't kept mm-hmm. on top of it. But, but yeah, I mean, even to this, I, here's what I can say: even to this day, people continue to make have new takes, and sometimes even I would say genuinely discover something new or that was not well understood about Plato um, or Aristotle, and um, and also, I mean, every every generation has to reinterpret um, uh, or, or at least understand for itself and its own individual members, um, any great philosopher of the past, and then see how their philosophy applies to ongoing changes in s- science, culture, um, human problems. Um, so it's, it's, never, it's never like a settled matter in, in a certain sense, even if we reach, you know, more or less the right interpretation. And that happens in, for various figures. Like there's a period of time where like, yep, they understood that person right. And then in hindsight or from our perspective, then later it looks like, oh God, they, they totally misread this person back in the first century or, you know, um, but even, even if they have got it, there's a period where they've got it. Um, it, it has to it has to at least be adapted. It has to at least be re-understood, if nothing else. These types of conversations are like a choose your own adventure book, you know, where you could like you could make a turn at any point and just go down that route. Like we could spend the whole episode just talking about what that means for each yeah. generation of study. But I'm going to resist the temptation to ask further about that. And I'm going to ask you this. Um, what was going on when Kant appeared in the world of philosophy? I know there were like two major schools of philosophy. What was going on? What was the situation? And then what was Kant's project all about in sort of addressing the problems that were there? Okay, sure. So I, I, um, they are sometimes called schools. I, I wouldn't call them s- schools. Be- and people I, at the time, I don't think really thought of themselves that way. But 
there were what historians of philosophy uh, now look back really since Kant and, uh, and Kant and Kant's student Reinhold have sort of seen philosophy in the 17th and 18th century as largely following into two or three um, paths of, of what we are, is now called empiricism um, on the one hand, rationalism on the other. And if you want to distinguish skepticism from either of those two, then you could say skepticism was a third. Um, in, so Kant was in Prussia um, and which was growing in, in um, power as a military um, kind of state. Um, and Kant was one of the recognized leaders of the Aufklärung movement, which is just the German Enlightenment movement, along with Moses Mendelssohn and a few others. Um, and um, the philosophy that was current, that was sort of dominant in Kant when, in the time when Kant sort of came up um, in, in German speaking lands was a kind of, of a, la a later day version of, Leib of the Leibnizian system developed by Wolf. So the Wolfians were kind of in ascendance in Germany and that was a, a form of rationalist dogmatism. You kind of started from self-evident first principles, you tried to deduce lots of abstruse metaphysical stuff. And um, uh, in particularly in Britain, um, you had a tradition going back to Francis Bacon and then John Locke of kind of basing knowledge on experience, um, starting with the senses. Um, but it had taken different turns in, in Berkeley. Uh, it had kind of turned to a certain kind of idealism. In Hume, it turned to a kind of radical skepticism. And Hume eventually had a big impact on Kant. And then in terms of, so, um, and we can talk about rationalism and empiricism and where Kant fits into that. I should also say that there are kind of, there, there were at the same time, different moral theories. In Kant's lectures on ethics, he often talks about ancient systems like Stoicism and Epicureanism, which people were getting interested in and revisiting. Um, but also there were just sort of systems based on, on series of duties and natural law that were very popular. Um, there was, of course, various kind of religious ethics. And then in, again, in Britain, there were theories more based on moral sentiment. Um, and, and you also had the other, another figure that had a very powerful impact on Kant, who happened to have been um, a personal friend of David Hume's, was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And um, uh, while Kant's views are not the same as Hume's, nor the same as Rousseau's, they had a, I, I tend to think of them as having some of the biggest impact on him. Um, we can, but we can talk a little bit more about what the state of the play of those schools was. And then we can also, if you want, we can talk about anything you want, but uh, what Kant's impact was on, on the field, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's that's kind of mind blowing that David Hume and Rousseau were friends like uh, so you see a lot of this, I guess. Uh, John Locke was friends with uh, who Newton, maybe like you, you see a lot they of were. these. Newton, that's, Newton, um, Newton, unfortunately, it's seemingly suffering the results of mercury poisoning um, kind of had a mental breakdown. He attacked Locke on some kind of paranoid nonsense. Locke was a total mensch about it. And when Newton got right again, he apologized and they made up. Um, and uh, yeah. It's, it's amazing. The world is such a small place. I've heard that Albert Einstein went to college with the uh, rabbi fr from Lubavitch, you know, the, uh... the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that, that, that I wouldn't surprise me. The Lubavitcher Rebbe himself was actually not, not his followers, but he himself was, I believe um, a trained uh, engineer um, and, and was well, uh, um, versed in modern mathematics and, and science. Yeah. So, some of the Lubavitcher Hasidim think that actually Einstein got what he knew, what he, you know, got his, his knowledge or whatever the, from the Rebbe, like the Rebbe talk, get, was too busy with religious studies and just, he gave Einstein his discoveries. Yeah. But, and there are some <laughs> ancient Jews and Christians who think that Plato got his philosophy from Moses, but 
they weren't right either. <laughs> so they weren't right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Jokes aside, uh, or back to the topic at hand. So the empiricists and the rationalists, they, they, many people think they disagree on everything, which I suppose in a, a lot of ways they do. But one thing they agree on is that the only real knowledge you have is in your head already in your head is that correct right yeah so even as early as as even as early as Descartes um who's a generation before Locke um not so much in Bacon but 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 in Descartes and certainly in Locke and then definitely in Berkeley and definitely in Hume um you do have this kind of what's sometimes called the way of ideas which is that we kind of do philosophy by looking at these ideas or impressions that we have these are understood to sort of be mental phenomena, um, they are not, these figures are not direct realists about perception. So like, they don't think that like, we just see the thing, it, they, they're sort of, you as our perception gives us ideas or impressions. And then what you very quickly end up with is a problem that we today sometimes call the veil of appearances. So, um, so if you think, so think of it like this, um, uh, you, uh, you look at an object and you and I um, see it in, in color and someone you know, tells us that um, the dog, uh, a dog sees it in black and white. Um, and then the question is, okay, so the color, is it, you know, is it real? Is it really in the object? Um, what about, um, and, and, then, and then what some people do, Locke does this, um, and, and Locke actually got it from um, Boyle, um, and the, these empiricist British chemics, uh, ch chemists, um, you, you distinguish primary and secondary qualities, you say, and this idea really comes from ancient atomism. Um, and you say, okay, well, the shape of the little particles that make this up, that's real. The motion of those things, that's, that's real. Um, but the, you know, but the flavor that it has when it hits your tongue, that's like maybe caused by those underlying things, but that's not in the, but the flavor is not in the thing. That's just you. Um, and Descartes says similar things. Descartes also thinks there's just extension and motion um, and that other things are sort of built on the imagination on the basis of it. But then you get this further problem, uh, which is one, one way you sort of, can go from there is, well, what about other things like space and time, right? Like wh why, is, why, is, why do we assume that extension or motion or shape, why do we assume that's really in the object? You know, you could imagine a kind of creature that thought of these things non-spatially or, or maybe, I, maybe you can't imagine it, but you can at least put, it, put those words out and it makes some coherent sense. Um, or, or in general, um, if we have direct access to, um, to the stuff in our mind and not the world, then at minimum, at minimum, finding out things about the world is at least a two-stage process where like, we would have to, one, kind of translate from what's in our head to what's in the world. And two, we would have to sort of validate in principle that translation process. We'd have to say, how is it I can go from this mental stuff to objective or external worldly stuff? And very quickly, what you find is that these, that, that, you, um, that you can't readily bridge this. Um, the empiricists, I think, see, come to that, in some ways come to that sooner, that is, um, that is to say, with Barclay, it just becomes idealism. With Hume, it just becomes um, radical skepticism. Um, the rationalists, uh, essentially, it, it, one way to think about them, one way that I think Kant thinks about them, is that they think that pure reason, by using various self-evident truths, can sort of deduce our way out of this problem. That it can, and in fact, that's exactly what Descartes does in the meditations after he establishes his Archimedean point, his sort of foundational point that can't be doubted, the cogito, and that I am a thinking thing um, and I exist. Um, 
and then and then on top of that, using very metaphysical, abstract ideas, a proof of the existence of God. Um, he he goes from those two kind of things to a, an argument that God wouldn't be a deceiver, and so he wouldn't completely deceive me about there being an external world. And you kind of get the world back, which you by the end of the second meditation it had left in doubt if there was anything that existed other than your own mind. Um, and you get it back by using these very abstract, metaphysical, um, and you know, in a word, rationalist principles. Um, similarly, you know, the Wolfians um, they tried to use the the law of non-contradiction, a law of logic, self-evident truth. And from that, they derived the principle of sufficient reason. Um, Kant didn't think they should do this. But the principle of sufficient reason is that every effect must have a sufficient cause. And that gets in, you into all kinds of trouble really quickly. And then on the basis of that, they kind of developed, they, they sort of deduced a kind of principle of causality, you might say. And, and Kant thinks that they were sort of guilty of taking sort of formal ideas sort of things that, and, and making kind of material conclusions from it or, or from taking something in idea and, and, and making some conclusion in fact. So even though he's sort of in some ways more at home in the background of, of um, the Wolfians, though he knew of Locke's work um, and, knew, knew, and calls him the estimable Mr. Locke, um, we, uh, he, 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 even from an early point, even in the, 1760s um, is all in the dreams of a spirit seer. Um, Kant is already comparing rationalists to mystics like Swedenborg, um, who think that by using reason, they can get at some outside world or at, at the things in themselves. And one reason the book, The Critique of Pure Reason, is called The Critique of Pure Reason, is that part of what Kant was doing was he was saying reason does not have the power to prove these big metaphysical questions. Reason cannot prove to you there is or isn't a God. Reason cannot prove to you the will is or isn't free. Reason can't prove if the universe has a beginning in time or is eternal. Reason wants to tell us this because reason by its nature is a kind of systematizing faculty that tries to pull everything together. But reason can't sort of pull everything in the sense of reason is not furnished materials that go beyond the senses. And you would have to sort of do that to go on beyond the sensible world and talk about the sensible world as a totality and say where it comes from or not, is it organized by a supreme being or not? Things of that, things of that nature. Yeah, There's Kant. a whole lot else that is going on in the critique of pure reason, but that's at least why it's called what it's called. And um, yeah. he, he doesn't, Kant doesn't think uh, reason could tell you if there's a God or not, or if there's free will, but he can, reason can maybe tell you uh, what temperature ice melts at or. or no, I mean, so, like well, re, um, uh, the, the use of the understanding and sensibility. So, which give us, intuitions or perceptions, right? And concepts. Um, sensibility is the faculty of intuitions or perceptions. Understanding is the faculty of concepts. Um, these are what we use to kind of cognize the world. Um, and I, I don't, um, as time goes on, Kant more and more uses, uses reason. It, it, in, when the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason comes out in 1781, um, he's still using reason as, as it relates to both theoretical and, and scientific and practical and moral matters. Over time, he more and more tends to just use reason to be synonymous with practical reason and, and kind of moral stuff. Um, but, but sure, if, I mean, that's one way of putting it. What, what he tends to think is that, it, it, yeah, I, I, yes, yeah, so, so he, so, okay, so it's, Tricky, but here's the basic idea. For Kant, um, we don't know we don't know anything that is outside of sense experience and 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 not in space and time. On top of that, we don't sort of know with what he calls apodictic certainty, that is like 
dem deductive demonstrative certainty like in mathematics. We don't know with apodictic certainty things that are a posteriori, that are just based on past experiences. So to the extent that what we know about temperature is, is just based on some past experiences, we can say what those past experiences are, but we can't like make a firm law. And then, and then there is a kind of category of what we call the, the synthetic a priori, um, which is things about the structure of experience, about how our own minds structure experience in order for it to be, uh, and that are basically sort of um, construction rules, that is, in, you, in order to construct coherent experience as such, we have to do certain things, or are, we do do certain things. Without those certain things, we couldn't have experience as such. So as long as we have experience as such, we know it will have certain operating features, and those we can know with certainty to hold for experience, because it would fall apart without it. And maybe it will fall apart, but, but as long as there's experience, it'll be there. And, and so those are substantive. They're not just like A equals A, um, but, they, but they are a priori. They are certain and not based on experience. And so Kant, so Kant thinks that you know, mathematics and certain aspects of physics, um, we can know with sort of law-like certainty, um, other kinds of empirical things we can have like empirical familiarity with, and we can say that, but we can't know for certain because they're a posteriori. And in general, if we just derive it from experience, from particular experiences, Kant thinks it you can't, that does not scale up to, to certain knowledge. And then there's any kind of claim we would make that goes beyond experience about which we cannot know at all. All we can say in the case of something like God or freedom of the will is that reason can neither prove nor disprove that the, these things are so. And therefore, if there is some practical reason for us to believe it or some practical necessity for us to believe it, we can have a kind of justifiable faith. It is faith, not knowledge, but it's and, and its justification is not epistemic. It's not the justification of having good evidence. It's the practical justification of, I have a good reason to want to believe this. Um, a good reason, not evidence, but a need. So for example, um, he, there's this sort of moral argument for God, like, well, we have these duties. We know that these duties can conflict with happiness. Um, it would be really hard if we lived in the kind of world where it was just impossible to do our duties at all without it just like destroying us. Now, if there is a God, which is to say a common author of the laws of nature and the laws of morality, we would be, we would, we could be in a universe where doing your duty was consistent with a reasonable amount, a bearable amount of happiness. We will, we don't, we'll never know if we live in that kind of world or not. We have to act like we are. Why? We have an absolute moral duty to do our duty. We have to act like it's not self, pure self-sabotage to do that. And we don't know if it, maybe it is, but we have to act like it's not because of our duty. And to do that, we need to, we need to believe that somebody made this universe line up appropriately. So, and no one can prove that it isn't so, or no one can prove that it is, so choose to believe. And this is a theme I think that probably an aspect of Kant's um, philosophy that um, it is, it, it is what he means is well captured in his famous saying, I found it necessary to deny knowledge to make room for faith. Meaning I found it necessary to deny the supposed BS knowledge posited by these rationalists that they could deduce the existence of God, that they could do this, they could do that, in order to make room for genuine faith. It all, and I, I also think it's, it's something you can see like later on reflected in the, something like the will to believe by William James and, and, and others. Um, mm -hmm. 
many, so many people, especially like atheists and all types of uh, secularist intellectuals, they think Kant is doing great work. He's basically saying you cannot prove whether or not God exists or anything like that. So leave that to the, uh, leave that to the faithful, but let's, but we're able to use reason to deal with, with reality. So to them, they think that he's doing, he's moving away from mysticism. Is that a, is that a fair? Is I that think a, for some, I mean, I think there are, there are some atheists. I mean, and if, if you're, if atheism does not equal agnosticism, if those are really distinct categories, then atheists are the people who say there is no God. Like this thing that you call God doesn't make sense. There's no evidence for it or at anything, or if, or if nothing else, it's like, you know, a teacup behind the dark side of the moon. It's like any arbitrary claim, give me some evidence. And until there's evidence, it's like you haven't said anything. Um, but there are some, you know, some people who are agnostics and, and they are agnostics on a kind of verificationist or a um, kind of picture and they say something like that ah, well science can't science can't prove one way or the other something it's, it's it's not empirical and god's sort of not an empirical question and so you know we just don't know one way or the other um and i think this is a very bad um uh and, and if you think in Kant's doing good work there uh, i think you've made a real problem uh, be, particularly because i think met, metaphysics I, first, I think we can have knowledge of the empirical world um, a posteriori, that is from experience. And I think also, you know, that, that metaphysics is not detached from that. That metaphysics is not something that goes beyond experience or just talks about the structure our mind imposes on the world, but is something that we can see um, from within. I, I will say this. Um, Kant, um, Kant did have a really, I, I think it, it must, maybe other people influenced the following pattern I'm about to describe as well, but I tend to think it, it, it's really Kant. Kant demolished the project of what we call rational theology or sometimes natural theology. Rational theology or natural theology is something people have been doing since Plato and Aristotle, literally starting with Plato and Aristotle, where they try to kind of look at the world and using philosophy, try to prove that there is, there are gods or a God. And, and the idea is like, we're gonna be, we're not taking this on faith. We're not just saying this because tradition, our ancestors all worship these things. So they must be true. We're, we're gonna do science slash philosophy the way we know how to do it and use reason and evidence and reach certain conclusions. Um, and people, that was, a, that was a major intellectual project in pagan, Jewish, Christian, Islamic worlds ever ever since Plato. Um, and, and Kant killed it. I mean, it still, it still sputtered on in the sense that some people still did one version, one type of it, which is, I mean, look, look, there are still theologians, even to this day, who try to resurrect the ontological argument for some of this. Kant goes through and Late in late parts of the critique, and through these various arguments, kicks their butts. Um, and today, I would say the, the the part of rational theology that is that most survives is um, is the argument from design. But at least since Darwin, that's been on. It, I mean, that's basically been in hospice, um, and it's only sort of hung on because that some people just don't want to accept that it doesn't work. Um, but by and large, the, you know, very few philosophers who don't have very strong religious kind of motivations or just people, you know, people coming from within religions where they really have a motivated reason, try to do um, rational or natural theology. On the other hand, many people, more people subsequently try to do arguments from faith. So there's a huge difference between, let's look at this evidence. This evidence points to God's being real. On the one hand, from here's why it's okay to have faith that there are gods. One tries to take evidence and show that you can have knowledge of something. So from here's the evidence, here's the conclusion that this is real. The other says, okay, there isn't that evidence that it's real, um, but, there's, but there's some 
reason why you can believe anyway. And that's before Kant, Pascal's wager is a kind of version of that. Certainly after Kant, people like William James and many others do that. So Kant did, I really think he did seriously discredit the practice of rational natural theology, made it so it's really just not a part of most, it's not gone, but it's really not a mainstream part of um, philosophy or, or natural science anymore. Um, um, but, but he did um, in some ways increase the kind of turn to a worse, a much worse intellectual pro process. Um, I think, I think um, you know, arguments from faith are, are much more intellectually dishonest in a way. Um, yeah, um, I guess so to try and like uh, encapsulate, if that's the word, like what was happening in philosophy, what was the problem and then Kant's solution. So is this, is this basically right? The, the philosophers, uh, both empiricists and rationalists and all their variants, pardon the COVID pun, they were all struggling to connect um, a priori, you know, pre-experience. They're trying to connect that with synthetic knowledge that is like contingent experiential knowledge. They were, they were struggling to, to connect those two. And Kant says the, the structures, the, the time and space kind of infrastructure that you have before experience, that is in itself um, what makes your synthetic knowledge be the way it is, which means that synthetic knowledge is a priori, which means there's no conflict between synthetic and a priori. Well, Go so ahead. now it's not, it's, I mean, synthetic a priori is Kant's sort of way of, of looking at it. So, so I put it this way. Um, both empiricists and rationalists were struggling with how you could get from ideas, impressions to any kind of knowledge about the world. Um, and um, Kant, in his, what he had famously called his Copernican revolution, he said, stop asking that question. Instead of asking, how do you get from the head to the out to work, to, to knowledge of things in themselves, you can't ask how we have knowledge within. And you do so by saying that what is within is constructed by by the structures of the, the transcendental mind, that is um, the, a pri the a priori forms of sensibility and the a priori forms of the understanding, AKA the a priori intuitions of space and time on the one hand and the a priori concepts known as the categories on the other. These structure reality in certain, these structure the, of the phenomenal world the world of our experience, the mind constructed or the transcendental constructed world with certain rules. And those are substantive and they are a priori. And so that is how synthetic judgments are possible a priori, which he says is the problem of the, of the critique. There are a posteriori synthetic judgments. We all knew how, how we did that. Like, how do I know that like, um, I've seen fire that's hot. Like I saw fire and it was hot. It's just, that's not a priori and you can't really build up mathematics or physics or absolute moral laws that way. Because Kant thinks morality is about absolute rules and he thinks sort of like physics and math are about absolute rules. That's what knowledge looks like. You can't get that from, from just some a posteriori stuff as Kant thinks of it. You know, so the work. The Copernican revolution analogy is that so uh, people thought that everything revolves around the earth, including the sun. And then Copernicus says, no, actually, the earth is revolving around the sun. Now, in this case, Kant is saying, stop asking, what is it about existence that your consciousness is is telling you? But instead, what is it that existence existence are doing to reach your consciousness this way? No, 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 it's no. Not what are they doing to reach your, we don't even know about them or if causality to us would even apply because causality is an internal concept. It's, it's rather than asking, um, rather than asking, how is it possible to get at things in themselves so that we have no, to get at things in themselves from our own minds so that we can have knowledge? Ask, 
how is how is how is knowledge made possible by being the structure of our mind, not things in themselves? So the the like in so far as Kant has an argument for his view, transcendental idealism, as like an overarching thing, like how do you know the what's his argument that this is the phenomenal world, not things in themselves? It's often called the argument from geometry in the first part of the critique, the transcendental aesthetic. And the argument basically goes, well, look, um, if space and time, if space, if space was something about things in themselves, then our knowledge of kind of the space and its structural rules would just be a posteriori. And mathematics would never have absolute deductive certainty. But like, and so think of it like this, right? Like your choice of Euclidean geometry or non-Euclidean geometry, Kant only knew about Euclidean geometry. Non-Euclidean geometry had started to be developed in his, uh, while he was alive, but he did okay. Anyway, your choice between Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry or, or, or your proofs about what works within, within them. So within Euclidean geometry, the sum of the angles of a triangle always equal two right angles. And in non-Euclidean geometry, they don't. Um, like that's not some empirical finding. That's not like we went out and we just measured every triangle, you know, um, and so on. And so Kant thinks like we could never have the kind of knowledge of, of geometry, sort of science of space, if, if it was about things in themselves. It must not be about things in themselves. It must be about us, like something about our experience that guarantees that our experience is like that, namely that they are these absolute structures. Um, now, there are some problems with the argument from, from geometry, um, but uh, here's an analogy I like, I like to think of, right? Imagine, um, you know, you're in this, you're running this nightclub called Club Phenomena. And, which is out on Numinal Street. And, um, and you don't know the distribution of, of the population sort of out on Numinal Street. You're running Phenomenal Street. You can never get away from your desk. You're the manager of this club. Um, and, and so, you, you know, you don't even know, you don't even know if there are people out there, but um, you do have a kind of strict rule about like the sex or gen gender balance of people coming in. Like, you, you never invite, bring in more men than there are women, let's say, right? And so like, you know that it'll always be, and it just so happens you're, you know, your staff is 50-50, right? You know, it'll always be 50-50 in club phenomena, not because the population out there on Newman Street is 50-50, or that they have an equal, in, but, or that that population has equal interests in club phenomena, you know it's always 50-50 because that's all you let in. Now, if someone goes, well, what if one night, you know, the bouncer let somebody else in? Well, wait a minute. What if, you know, like, you know, a club gets a reputation, you know, for being, uh, you know, all one thing or all the other really fast, right? Like the whole nightclub would just shut down if this ever stopped being enforced. So as long as the nightclub gets going, this will be enforced because if it wasn't, no nightclub. And similarly, like if you had a stamping policy because you'd lose your liquor license if someone under 21 drank. So everyone who's 21 gets a stamp, right? Like, you know that everyone who's drinking in your club has a stamp, like, because that is the rule you set up or that is the rule that has to be there for it to function. And Kant in this famous part of the, uh, the, the, um, the, the critique, um, called the transcend, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the deduction of the categories of the, um, he, um, the transcendental deduction of the categories, he tries to show sort of why these concepts sort of must apply. There's actually quite a lot of scholarly disagreement. There's always been disagreement exactly about what he's trying to prove in the deductions, especially the B deduction. Um, the A deduction, I think makes a lot more sense, but, um, is more interesting, but, but in any case, that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Um, even though we're basically out of time and we still have super chats, I mean, 
what's so bad about all of that? Like, why, why does Ayn Rand see Kant as such a problem? Is it because he's, he's making consciousness primary when all is said and done, whereas the other, the, the earlier philosophers, the, the enlightenment philosophers, they were interested in understanding the world, but Kant is saying really your consciousness and club phenomenon phenomenal is all you'll really ever know. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's a couple, it's a couple things. So, mm-hmm. um, in earlier philosophers still wanted to try to get at the external world. Um, now, some of them were mystics and the external world they were trying to get at was an unreal, like, you know, heaven or something like that. Um, but it, at least they were trying and, and Kant literally, not only is more explicitly and clearly primacy of consciousness through and through, um, but also sort of made it the goal, we don't, we're not trying to get out of it. Like that's, this is the game. And all sort of subsequent philosophies have, um, not except perhaps Rand's um, or, or major ones at any rate, um, have kind of run with, with some Kantian insight that like, yeah, we have our sort of forms of awareness and forms of awareness are not means of cognition of reality. They are, a, they are the barrier to cognition of reality. And they are the means of cognition of our own constructed world. So that's thoroughly primacy of consciousness in a in a far more cons- in a totally consistent kind of way, and 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 by and even reversing the sort of aims of it, right unashamedly. And that's that's metaphysically and epistemologically, and ethically, Kant. Um, completely divorces morality from values and makes it entirely, um, uh, makes it entirely um, uh, w- w- what's called deontological, entirely based on duties or obligations. And again, re- religion had sort of done this too, and certain, or some religions had done this too, but Kant is far more explicit. He kind of gave it a veneer of secularity um, or, you know, he made it, you know, he basically made it easier to have religious ethics without the religion part. Um, and, and, compl- and like literally drove a wedge between I ought to and there's some good in it for me or anyone, or some good at all. In it. Um, so now what was right and what was good are just totally distinct. Um, and I think she thinks, yeah, he's just in that. And by these two kinds of broad movements and all the particulars involved in them, He's, you know, the, the, the quote unquote, all destroyer. This is deep. All right. Let's uh, let's read some super chats. We got Robert with two dollars says, happy Friday. Have a phenomenal weekend. All right. Jonathan. Uh, thanks, John- Robert. Jonathan with four ninety nine. And then Michael with five dollars says, is my understanding correct of Kant? Anytime there seems to be a snag in providing answers to questions of knowing Kant brushes off as incomprehensible, quote unquote. No, no. I mean, that's 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 not true. That's not the, the, the whole question of the first critique or the whole positive critique has a positive project and a negative project. The negative project is is something like that where it but where much of what he was attacking, <clears throat> he's he's wrong to think there are no answers to is there a God? Is there, or, Sorry, he doesn't think there's no answer. He's wrong to think we can't know. Is there a God or not? Is there free will or not? Um, He's right that using rationalist metaphysics does not answer these questions and uses a whole lot of specious reasoning. Um, So that was the, that was the, and in a sense, he's, uh, yeah, so that was the negative project. But the positive project is to show how are synthetic judgments possible a priori. Kant, is sitting there thinking like, how can we know? We know math, how? Um, in a sense, it's a very similar problem to what Plato was facing. That is, they are both, they are anti-empiricists. They, are an, they do not think knowledge sort of comes from sense perception of the world, but they are not skeptics. They absolutely believe that there is certain kinds of certain knowledge. And so Plato makes it knowledge of another world where, and Kant makes it the knowledge of our, of our constructed world. 
So one is a one is a metaphysical idealist, the other is a psychological idealist. But both sort of in response to the problem of of the um, what 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 um, what uh, Chomsky called Plato's problem. We seem to have knowledge, but empirical input suck. In response to sort of quote unquote Plato's problem, they propose. Um, they, and they go to length, you know, show, and con in more technical detail and, um, in Plato of, of how that, that works. It's just both of them take it away from the external world as the, the set, but both end up making the sensible world not really real, which is bad. Yeah. Okay. And yes, and we, we, we can go all into the positive philosophy Ayn Rand offers and kind of once we're equipped with that, we can sort of identify a lot of, um, a lot of steps that other philosophers skip to get to where their starting point, I suppose. All right. Super chat. Uh, Michael with 999 says Kant is a more consistent version of Plato and Rand is a more consistent version of Aristotle. The ultimate boss is Plato. All bad ideas in history are spinoffs of Plato. And you say, well, um, so yeah, I know that's what uh, Leonard Peikoff says at the end of his uh, Opar book. Um, I don't, you know, I, I wrestle with this as, as somebody who spent a lot of time on Plato and a lot of time on Kant. Um, there's a sense in which I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, um, there's something. There is something different about about their view. You know. The way Leonard puts it is, is um, Kant is Plato shorn of Hellenism and Rand is Aristotle shorn of Platonism, which is a very witty way of putting it. Uh, and I, I, I love that formulation, but I, I sometimes think that um, uh, I, I don't, the shorn of Hellenism, but it, it's, it's hard. I mean, like there's something essentially mystical about Plato. I mean, there's something mystical too about Kant, particularly when he starts talking about morality and where the categorical imperative comes from and how we get it. That's where you see Kant is sort of most mystical, most like he's less skeptical and more like somehow we just magically know. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I will say, let me, let me say this. I will say that in terms of who's the final boss, um, as you'll know, for many a video game and many an anime, when you encounter the final boss and defeat him, he then takes on his final form, which is the ultimate part of the boss fight with the ultimate boss. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, Kant would be, you know, Kant would be. So uh, now I assume my final form, you know. So uh, Plato is like Shredder from Ninja Turtles. And then when Shredder drinks the ooze and becomes super Shredder, now he's Kant. Is yes. that a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. In this, but in TMT2, Secret of the Ooze. Mm -hmm. So I think as human beings, we want stories and we want absolutes. Like we want to see this as the embodiment of evil and this guy over here as the good guy. And oftentimes there are very clear cut good guys and bad guys. And there are the stories we sort of are often accurate summaries, but when it comes to something like this, like there's going to be some nuance and it, it's like, it's, it's, it's one thing for Leonard Peikoff who really, really took the time to read this to then say, you know, Kant is, is such and such and Plato is such and such, but the, the average reader, like we, we might sometimes rush too quickly to jump into this, this uh, video game analogy and sort of run with it. But as today's episode ought to demonstrate to, uh, to, to me and to many of the viewers, um, scholarship is serious business. And, um, you know, reading a paragraph in a nonfiction essay in one of Rand's essays is not, um, is not sufficient to really, really play with the big boys in terms of discussing and understanding Kant in the context of history. There's kind of the lesson I've, I've learned, I think. Um, all right. Uh, Jonathan. Any comment or should I keep going with the, with just, the chat? Just say, don't hate what you don't know. Um, if you know and understand something and you think it's awful and you hate it, that, that's okay. I, I think in general, um, you know, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Um, 
Jonathan with 99 cents. And, and, you know, I mean, focus on the positive is kind of what I tend to say. I mean, I, I know Ayn Rand a hell of a lot more than I know Kant um, in terms of their work. Let so me, I focus on what I do agree with and what I do want to study. I will say something that I think will shock, maybe will shock some of your listeners. Um, I have, I, not only do I love studying Kant and really actually in a, bizarre, in a perverse way have learned to love to read Kant, mm. um, um, like somebody who's acquired a taste for Uzo. <laughs> um, uh, I, um, uh, I, uh, I have learned positive philosophic things from Kant. He is a genius. He's brilliant. And some of his, some of his insights are, are put their finger exactly on a fundamental issue. Even if he takes the wrong stance on it, he gets to the heart of things in a way that nobody except Plato and Aristotle and maybe Ren do. Um, he's, it, and, and it's really insightful. Um, and so, I mean, that was a long process learning what you could sort of distill, but you know, you can, it's not like, look, there are some post Kantian philosophers and it's a lot of, and it's a lot of gobbledygook. Some of it makes sense. Some, maybe some of it doesn't, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, but where like, you know, it's real hit or miss whether there's anything intelligent going on. And, and the Kant's not like that. It's always going to be really, really intelligent stuff that's, that's worth spending time thinking about, even if, it's, even if it's profoundly wrong and even if you profoundly dis- come, to, come to profoundly disagree with it. And we are truly out of time. So um, let me just, uh, let's, let, we need to wrap it up because we got uh, Jim Brown coming up in, uh, in about five, six minutes. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Marilene. Thank you, Marilene again. Thank you, Michael again. Thank you, uh, Kirk, and thank you, Enric. Thank you, Atlas Spoke, and thank you, um, Allison. Sorry we didn't get to all of your comments, but uh, hopefully we will store your questions and comments away for the future, or not hopefully, we will. Um, Yeah, we need to wrap it up there. So coming up at um, 7 p.m. UK time, which is in a few minutes, Jim Brown's Investing Show. And today's topic is false profit. It's it's the, his new show. I used to he used to be the CEO of uh, the Ayn Rand Institute, wasn't he? For for a little bit of time, uh, I used to say, "Oh, there's the muscle." I said, "He's he's like a he's a he's he's in good shape." <laughs> there's the muscle. Um, so uh, that so we've got a former and a current CEO of ARI here on the network right now. Tal Tal Tsvani just launched his new show. Uh, Eight p.m. After an hour later on the channel, we've got James Valiant discussing Leonard Peikoff's lecture, A Picture is Not an Argument. Then at 10 p.m. UK time, it's TV Talk with Mark Pellegrino and the writers of The Strike. Today, they'll be discussing the show Justified. All right, uh, Jason, good Lord, we barely scratched the surface of everything I wanted to discuss, uh, but time as you know, philosophical questions aside, Tom, time seems to be very, uh, very strict and uncompromising. So uh, looking forward to continue, continuing the conversation. Let's bookmark this. Thank you. I, thanks for having me. Sure, of course. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation. Stay tuned for the Jim oh, Brown. Can I, can I plug my podcast? Please. No, I'm just kidding. Everyone plugs a podcast. Ah, uh, wait, do you not have a podcast? we're working on it you know we're working on it i was gonna say if you had a podcast and i didn't know about it uh no. yeah you'd be the first let's put it this way anyone who wants to see that podcast happen speak up all right everybody thank you see you all very soon see you soon jason and goodbye Bye.